If you would take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 7, we're going to begin in verse 15, Romans 7, 15. And those of you who are joining us online, a special welcome to you. Uh, I want you to know that there's a way that you can be prayed for. I know you can't be with us today in person, but maybe you're even watching this later uh, on YouTube or on the Facebook page. We'd love to pray for you. If you go to our church's Facebook page, you'll see that we have a group called Ridge Prayer, and you can go to that, that group, and you can request to join it, and you can... Um, Type in any prayer request that you have. We have a team of people who are waiting to pray for you any day of the week. So just keep that in mind. We're glad that you're here with us today to worship. Um, we're going to be looking in Romans chapter 7. There's a lot of new things going on. We've been studying the book of Romans about how God is calling us to a bigger table as siblings in Jesus. We're gathered around this table. We've been seeing this through the whole book of Romans. And I want you to know how this table... And I keep pointing down. I don't know if those of you online can see it, but there's a communion table right down here. This table that we're talking about, this table we've been talking about for, the la for this entire summer, this bigger table was always meant to lead to smaller tables where we would meet together as followers of Jesus and get to know each other, listen to one another, encourage one another as we follow Christ. And here's kind of a, I want to go into like a, a big announcement, a promotional announcement for what's coming up on September 12th. On September 12th, we're changing our Sunday morning format. Yes, again, we're always changing things, right? But we're going to go and do another change. And I want to explain, I want you to see how this bigger table leads to smaller tables. When we come in this time and we worship together, let's go to the next uh, screen, uh, the next slide on the screen there. It is, there it is. That's what you see on the screen is, this is called, at 9 o'clock, beginning September 12th, we're, we're Pastor Christelle, I love this, this phrase, she gets, classic worship, okay? What does that mean? That means, it, you might think of it as more traditional, but we like the word classic. Classic, it would be led by the choir, choir a choral-led worship time at 9 o'clock, beginning September 12th. 12th. There will be a nursery available for those who want to make use of the nursery ministry. Also, children will be joining us every Sunday in the sanctuary for the first part of the service. I'm so looking forward to all the generations worshiping together at the opening of our services. And then we'll have like a children's moment of some sort, and then we'll dismiss the kids. And that the age of the kids will be pre pre-K to fifth grade, they'll go to children's church, and then we'll continue to worship here together at nine o'clock. Let's go to the next slide. The next slide is 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock, you know, we always use the word contemporary, right? Let's just change that word, Pastor Chris Delke. Let's call it modern. How's that sound? Modern worship, and you won't need earplugs. Okay, modern worship. We're going to have a modern worship service that's going to be band-led, uh, and we're also going to have a nursery at that service. And kids will also be with us in that service at the first part of it. And then we'll have a children's moment. And then they'll be dismissed to go to their children's church classes ages pre-K pre through fifth grade. What if you have a child who's over fifth grade? They're stuck in here with us the whole time. They just have to sit here and endure what we do. No, not endure. This is going to be the, they're going to have great experiences worshiping with us. Now, here's the next slide I want you to see. This is what's new. This is how we go from the bigger table to smaller tables. And you can see there that that drawing, we're going to have something called 10 o'clock Ridge Bridge. What we want to do is we want both services to get to know each other as opposed to just passing in the lobby and going to their cars between services. We would love to give you an opportunity to sit down at tables in the gym. In the gym, we have an extended fellowship time. Coffee will be available. Some grab and go food will be available there. You can, you can just get to know one another and sit at tables. We go from the bigger table to these smaller tables of fellowship. And while that's going on, there's going to be a nursery, also full, a full hour of children's Sunday school classes with all the different ages will take place during that time. So as the parents want to meet with other parents and other adults, their kids will be ministered to by our volunteers who are teaching them in Sunday school at 10 o'clock. And then the youth group will also be meeting from 6th grade to 12th grade. That's the youth group ages as we gather around tables in the gym. Now, people are saying, when are we going to have Sunday school classes for adults and Bible studies? We're going to have them. They're going to feel a little different. They're going to feel a little different in this way because what we want to do is we want to have like six to eight week, maybe ten week electives so they'd be short-term 
sort of, uh, there'd be an ending date for that class. It'd be topical, or it'd be a book of the Bible that we'd be doing. And anybody who's meeting in the gym can spin out of the gym and go to these different rooms that'll be having Bible study electives. And then when that elective's done, you go back into the gym and you get to know people. You, you invite people to sit with you. You welcome people you don't know. Let, let's face it, there's so much change that's happened in, in Maple Ridge Church. Everybody feels like a new person. We got to get to know each other all over again. And so we want to do that at this 10 o'clock ridge bridge time. There will be adult Bible study electives. It will not start on September 12th. We want to get to know each other for a few weeks, and then sometime in October, we'll announce a slate of different uh, electives that you can go to if you'd like to for six to eight weeks. Now, there's something else we're going to do with that bridge bridge time. Ridge Bridge is going to be an hour where we're going to have an uh, opportunity for, for individuals like Steph Page from Stories Foundation to come and share in that environment where she can say a little bit more. We can interact with her and ask questions. And then she can sit down with us and we can talk at, around tables and, and learn more about it. So our missionaries will be brought into that hour. Here's something else we're going to try. I've never done this before. We're going to do our business meetings then. We're going to try this to see how it goes. This is all experimental, you know. And so we're going to try this. By the way, this is part of the sermon. You're thinking, why is he doing this? This is part of the sermon. You're going to see. This is, you're going to see. But business, normally we've done business meetings at the end of our second service. And what happens is those who come at 9 o'clock then have to leave and then come back to church. And so we thought this is a great time for us to create a space to do church family business together at 10 o'clock. Let's just see how it goes. I, I just want to experiment and see how this all ends up. Now, what are we going to do when we're done with Romans? By the way, I've gone through Romans at a breakneck pace. You know that, don't you? I hope you're proud of me because you know how long it took me to get through Luke, right? Three years. Romans could have been a 10-year project, people. I did it in one summer. So I hope, I hope you're all patting me on the back. I know I am, right? So, but I've been, what I've been doing in the book of Romans is giving you some handles so as you as a follower of Jesus sit down with your Bible and you start reading it, you can understand basically a way to interpret what you're reading and understand it. You have the outlines, you can go back and look at it, you can listen to the messages, and that way you can do a deep dive on your own with the guidance of the Holy Spirit and his illumination to read his word and go, oh, that's what he's talking about here. Now what are we going to do what am I going to preach on next? It's going to be a short book. A short book that we're going to start. We're going to start September 12th. But I'm not promising you it's going to be a short series. Okay? Let me just say that from the get-go. We're going to go through the book of Galatians. Why the book of Galatians? The book of Galatians was written to a church that had a problem meeting in the gym around tables. And so I want to look at what is it we can do to have spirit-filled, Holy Spirit-filled lives as we follow Jesus and have a place of welcoming each other at little tables. That's what the book of Galatians is going to be about. What are we going to do after Galatians? So you see, some of you want to know, well, where are you going after that? Then we're going to tackle the book of Exodus. Yeah, oh boy, that was a groan. I hear a groan. No, no, no. It's going to be amazing, because here's what you're going to find out. In the book of Exodus, you're going to find out how does God shape and form his people as they go through wilderness experiences. That is our lives today, isn't it? We go through wilderness, and we, God, where are you? And God is speaking to us. God is reaching out. God is inviting us into his story of redemption. We need to understand what we're becoming in the wilderness we might be going through in this season of life. So let's get right to Romans now that I've done that really great plug for September 12th and what's coming up. And I'll do it again. I'll do it again next week so you can see this, this slide presentation here. But here's something else. The next slide, if we could look at this. It's a question. And it's a question about this slideshow. Would you welcome a new friend to your table? I hope so. One of the things I really enjoy about Maple Ridge Church is we are a friendly church. But, you know, there's a danger in saying that because after you've been here for a while, you can say, oh, we're so friendly. But you do know there's a difference between being a friendly church and a church of friends. Do you know the difference? In other words, walk into a church and be new for the first time and see it through their eyes. So when you see somebody come into the gym and they're all by themselves, you're waving them over to your table or 
if you walk into the gym and you don't know somebody, you take the initiative and you sit at their table and you say, I'd like to sit here. People, we got to get to know each other. Invite each other in. Will we welcome a new friend to our table? Because in the book of Romans, the Christians in Rome had such a hard time welcoming people to the table. They had a hard time because the headlines of their day were so divisive. Think of the things that we're wrestling with. Even this very minute, there are people in Louisiana, in our country, who are fleeing for their lives because of a hurricane. There are, there are school districts in parts of our country who are fighting and, 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 and casting uh, accusations at one another. There is so much anger politically. We have people in Afghanistan who are trying to get out. We have brave soldiers. We have men who are from our own church wearing the uniform, who around the world are serving our military, and we have to pray for our soldiers. We have to pray for our government. We live in very divided times. Just like they did when the book of Romans was written. And sometimes what happens when you feel like everything's out of your control, you watch the headlines and everything's out of control, whether it's a natural disaster or one that has political ramifications and military-driven issues, whatever it might be, how out of control the world feels, here's what we do as human beings, and Romans talks about this, here's what you do, you try to create rules to control people. Because when you can't control your circumstances, maybe you can control others through rules. And that's what Romans 7 is about. By the way, rules are really good. God's law, the law of God, the Ten Commandments, the Torah, is good. But the law, as you look at Romans 7, you're going to see the law does not have the power to change the human heart. You can't pass laws to change human nature. You do have to pass laws, good, just laws, to change human behavior but the nature can remain unchanged and that's what Romans 7 is about now you have your Bibles open to Romans 7 verse 15 but would you write this down the power of the law cannot make us like Jesus the power of the law cannot make us like Jesus I mean you can know the right thing to do from the Bible the rules in the Bible are from God. He gives us things to keep, keep on the right path. But here's the thing. As human beings, our hearts, when we feel things are out of control around us, our hearts keep wanting to do the opposite of what we know is right. And then we become miserable. We know the right thing to do, but we can't do it. It's like there's, some, there's a battle going on within us. It's not just a battle that's taking place in our country or in our churches or in our state. There's a battle going on within each of us, and it makes us miserable. And we try to use rules to control people's behavior. So I want to give you a, a glimpse as to what goes on in the human heart. That's why we're looking at verse 15. Look with me at Romans seven fifteen, where it says... I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree the law is good. In other words, this person's very conflicted here. This person in this church in Rome is very conflicted because they know the right thing to do, and they keep battling within themselves, trying to use rules to change their heart, and it's not changing. Look at the middle of verse 18. It says, for I have the desire to do what's good, but I can't carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Verse 21. So I find this law, this rule at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Uh, for in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work within me, waging war against the law of my mind. See, it's in the mind. And making me a prisoner, they feel enslaved. Look what it says. Of the law of sin at work within me. And then verse 24, what a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. So our minds, listen, listen now. Our minds are divided. We're not at peace within ourselves with God. And honestly, 
We can't even control ourselves. And when we feel we can't control ourselves, oftentimes what we do is we say, well, if I can't even control myself, maybe I can control people around me to make things feel like it's under control. I can have a false sense of peace. And we use rules. We create rules to control other people's behavior. And when we have that, when that happens in your heart all day, all week long, when you're Monday through Saturday, when you're creating rules, trying to control and manipulate people around you using shame and guilt or whatever tactics you've been trained to use in your own experience, when that happens and then you come to church, you just baptize that stuff with God and you say, now I can do it for God. And that's what we have to avoid doing. So what should a follower of Jesus do? Well, I'm going to ask you to stop something. I'm going to ask you to stop. Would you write this down? Stop trying to fix others with rules and make them like you. We are supposed to be like Jesus. All of us. We're all on a journey following Christ. And our job isn't to fix each other. Our job is to love each other and welcome one another to tables The most important word in the book of Romans is not justification. I know Martin Luther may have taught you that. The most important word in the book of Romans is is the word welcome. Welcome. Look at who Jesus welcomed into meals. Look at what Jesus said to his followers who were all concerned about status and who's in power and who's in control. He put a little child around in the midst of them and said, whoever welcomes Me as this child, right? Welcome. Welcome is the most important book. Welcome is the solution to the control issues that we're dealing with. And as you've been following in the book of Romans, you know that there's two groups who couldn't get along with each other. Paul talks about them at the end of the book. The group he calls the weak. And the weak were, literally the word weak means powerless. They felt powerless when they came back to church. And the weak were using religion to guilt and shame other people into right behavior. The weak, the powerless, they don't have power, but they're trying to get it. And they're trying to get it using God. I think one of the greatest dangers facing the church today is Christian fascism. Christian fascism. Leaders in the church today who are using the political anger and hustlers of disillusionment politically in our country to try to take over the country and make it a Christian nation like we live in a theocracy. That's not God's call on the church. It's a dangerous movement also known as Christian Reconstructionism. And I have to warn you as a church, stay away from it. Ask Dietrich Bonhoeffer what happens When you have people who use religion and use God's name and marry it to the state. If you think it's a problem, then think of it in this way. Maybe you'll think of it as a problem then. Imagine trying to use Sharia law but using the Bible instead. That's Christian fascism. And that's what the weak were doing. That's what they tried to do, impose their their fascistic rules on other people. But there's another kind of fascism. It's not Christian fascism. It's the kind of fascism that the, the strong used in the church of Rome. They were also trying to impose. But you see, the, the Roman believers, the Gentile believers, the strong, the powerful in the church were using cultural pressure. Listen to this. Cultural pressure to guilt and shame other people into the right behaviors. They had the power of culture behind them. They had status behind them, and they always did it for the greater good of the state or the community. That's cultural fascism. And they're every bit as religious as the Christian fascists, because instead of worshiping some religious dogma, they worship the dogma of the state, and they harness big tech, and they want big brother to come in. And and this is the mess we're living in, people. This is the mess we live in. What is the solution to this? One of the authors I love to read, his name is Thomas Frank. He's a political analyst and a historian. For a while, he wrote as a journalist for the Wall Street Journal. He was a contributor there. Thomas Frank has this quotation. Look at this. He says, we live in a utopia of scolding. I thought that was an interesting turn of phrase. A utopia of scolding. Everyone wants to wag their finger, blacklist, and cancel everyone else. It might make you feel self-righteous, 
Christian fascist or cultural fascist. But he says that's not how to build a movement or win people over. For those of you who lean toward more of the conservative side of things, there's a famous uh, economist uh, from the Austrian School of Economics named F.A. Hayek or Frederick Hayek. Look at his quote. He takes this from the other angle. He says this. He's talking about his field of economics. He says, the curious task of economics is to illustrate to humanity how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. There's a lot of truth in that. You see, that's true of our church. That's true of any church. If we think, if we think that we can design and engineer just the right kind of church, the moment, the moment we gather at this table at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock in the fall, and we imagine we can engineer growth for other people, what we do is we end up creating churches that condemn somebody and scold somebody and shame somebody, and lead us into slavery of all kinds, and that's not God's intention. Romans 7, as you have your Bibles open, Romans 7 is the engineered church with all the right rules. The, the motto of that church is, if we fix it, they'll come, because if we fix it, then we can get them here, and we can fix them. Paul, look what he says in chapter 8, verse 1. A church full of condemnation. A church full of people condemning each other. Look at what he says. Look at what he says in verse 1 of chapter 8. Therefore, there is now what? No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you try to engineer and design people to become like you, with your master plan of controlling people's behavior, you're going to end up creating a condemned church. By the way, it's important that people do engineer things and condemn things. They're called architects. But that's, that, that's, that's about buildings, okay? We, we need to have them. We need to have people who understand, is this structure safe for human beings to be in? But churches are not supposed to be architecting and engineering other people's lives. Spiritually engineered churches create condemning environments and they are not safe for human souls. In fact, what happens when you go to a church like that, and maybe you've been at a church like that, it will wear you out because you don't know if you've ever kept enough rules. You go to a church like that, and it'll weigh you down. So it's no wonder what Jesus says to us. And this is the plea of Jesus to everyone in our country today. It's on the screen. Jesus said in Matthew 11, he said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened by whatever fascist is trying to oppress you. I added that part. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me because I'm gentle and humble in heart and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So let me ask you this morning, whose plan is running your family? Your plan or God's plan? Whose plan is running our church? Is it the Christian reconstructionists out of Moscow, Idaho? Or is it the cultural fascist out of Silicon Valley? Or is it the Jesus way? Is it the Jesus way? Look at the Jesus way. The Jesus way tells us our responsibility is to be here to love one another, speak the truth to one another in love, gather around tables, worship at the bigger table, break out to smaller tables so that we can create an environment and, and we just have to set the stage and say, God, no, you have to meet us. The Holy Spirit has to come and do a work because this isn't our agenda, this isn't our kingdom, this is your kingdom and we're asking for your will to be done. Don't make people to look like me, Jesus Create an environment here where people leave here looking like you. Our number one priority as a church is to create an environment where the words of Jesus on that screen become our reality together as we follow Jesus. I was listening to an interview a couple weeks ago by a pastor who I have tremendous respect for. His name is Pastor John Tyson. And he said this. He asked this question. He said, who are we becoming by what we are doing. You go to a church, they'll get you busy doing all sorts of stuff. 
Stop and ask yourself a question before you burn out from the rules. What are you becoming based on what you're doing? How do our lifestyles and our choices and just the rhythms, how are the rhythms we have in our everyday lives forming us? Are they forming us into more committed, devoted followers of Jesus? Or are we being shaped into some image of some celebrity pastor? God forbid. Romans 7 leads to Romans 8. And number two, if you'd write this down, in your outline, number two, the presence of the Holy Spirit makes us like Jesus. That's what, that's what it's about. You see it on the screen. The presence of the Holy Spirit makes us like Jesus. Now, uh, what I wanted to do is take a picture. I took a picture with my, my phone of the Pew Bible. It's on page 7, 1754, and it looks like this. Let's see this picture. There it is. There it is. I took one of the Pew Bibles, and I did something you might think is sacrilegious. I highlighted it, and I circled it. See it up there? By the way, that's a good practice to do. But what I want you to see in Romans 8 is how often Paul says, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy... Look at all those spirits, spirit, spirit, spirit. God's Spirit is doing something. Now we need to understand what is the relationship of the Holy Spirit as a follower of Jesus. The moment you start following Jesus, the moment you receive Christ as your Savior and Lord, you receive the Holy Spirit. You receive all of God. That doesn't mean God received all of you because that's a process where we keep turning over parts of our life to God and submitting to God and following God and letting God form us into the character of Jesus. But you receive all of the Holy Spirit and it's a continual life where you keep submitting and you say, Holy Spirit, I confess my sin and now I ask that you fill me. I give that part of my life to you. I give this part of my life to you. We're always yielding parts of our life to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is who Jesus sent to live within us individually and as a church after he ascended into heaven. Last Sunday, we saw some beautiful images like the one you see on the screen there. That is a beautiful image. And you couldn't hear what I was saying, but I would pray for each person before they were baptized. And then I would say, plug your nose. And I'd say, grab your wrist. And they did that. And, I, and, they would, and then I would say over them, I would, some of you are here right now. I see you. You were here last week. You were baptized. And I would say, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I baptize you. The Holy Spirit marks us from the moment you're immersed in Jesus. And he reminds us the moment you're baptized. And it's the Holy Spirit who conforms us, who shapes us into the image of Christ. Look with me at Romans 8. Uh, look at verse 28 in your Bibles. Romans 8, 28. It says this, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Verse 29, look at this. Look at this. I know you want to fight about predestination, but don't. It's not there for you to argue about. Look at, what, look at what happens here. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. People ask me, Pastor, what's God's plan for my life? What's God's will for my life? And my answer is right here. Be like Jesus. Be conformed to, into Jesus' image. Follow the, the, the rabbi, Jesus, and be covered in his dust. Would you write this down? Start living by the Spirit and allow others to be made like Jesus. Start living by the Spirit. The Spirit's all over chapter 8. And, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't go in because I have to make these sermons really short. I have to cover a lot of ground in a short period of time. And so I want you to see in one slide everything. That, look at this next slide. Look at, look at that. Nine ways the Holy Spirit makes us like Jesus. Verse 5, verse 6 and 7, verse 9. Verse 12, verse, I mean, I, I could go, we could have a sermon on each one of these. I don't have time for that. But, but, and neither do you. But here's what I want to do. I want to invite you to, and it's in your outline, I want you to, I invite you to go back and look at that. Look at each one of these. Look at what the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit of God comes into your life, he makes you like Jesus. He empowers you. He gives you. He tells you. He speaks to you. He gives you power to overcome things. He leads you. Number six. He frees you so that you can cry out. In fact, look, look with me. Look with me. At, if you have your Bibles open, look at verse 15. The spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. You can now be freed to call out to God as your Father. Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit does that within you. What a gift. Look at verse 16 where it says, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we're God's children. That's, that's number seven right there. 
Number seven, right there. That it re- the Holy Spirit reassures you that you're his child. That you belong to Jesus. Look with me at verse 26 where it says in your Bibles, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. If we do not know what we ought to pray for, have you ever been in that spot? You're really burdened, you don't know how, you can't even put into words what you're feeling. You've heard some bad news, your spirit is grieved. I'm hearing what's happening on the runway, in the airport, in Kabul, and I don't know how to pray. And I come before God and I say, Holy Spirit, help me pray. And the God Spirit will lead you in how to pray. It is amazing how God will do that. And that's what he's promising here. He will help us to pray when we don't know what to say. He intercedes for God's people according to the will of God. Now, I asked you earlier, I asked you earlier this question. Would you welcome a new friend to your table? And I hope your answer is yes. You're going to have a chance to demonstrate that, hopefully from the heart, on September 12th at Ridge Bridge at 10 o'clock in the gym. But let me just ask you this question as we close. Here's the question I want to ask you. As we close, I want to ask you this question. It's on the screen. Would you say this to a friend at your table? I'm going, to give you, I'm going to give you three things here, three things in your outline, uh, things I want to know if you can say, things you could say to a friend at your table. Now to frame it, I want you to look at verse 31. Romans 8, 31, look what it says. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen it is God who justifies who then is the one who condemns no one no one in church condemns other believers in Jesus look what it says Christ Jesus who died more than that was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Now I want you to hear something. God will not give up on you. God will not give up. God gave everything for you. So would you write this down? Would you say this to a friend? God gave everything for me, so I won't give up on you. Would you write that down? Could you say that to a friend at a table? God gave everything for me. So I'm not going to give up on you. Even though we disagree politically and we view life very differently from one another, you're my brother, you're my sister in Jesus Christ. We're both following Christ. I will not give up on you. We have been giving up on each other. Not, I'm not saying anybody, but, but just the American church. The American church has been giving up on each other during this pandemic and after the pandemic and whatever we're going to head into next. It has to stop. Look at verse 34. It says, who then is the one who condemns no one? Christ Jesus who died, more than that, was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, interceding for us. Look at this, verse 35. Look at verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword add your, to the list? Or hurricanes or terrorism or pandemics and viruses? Can you say this to a friend at the table? Here's the second thing to write down. Number two, Jesus prays for me so I won't pray on you. Boy, we need to hear that. We need to hear that. Jesus is praying for me. And you know, if Jesus didn't give up on me, why am I so quick to give up on you? And this is what we have to do at the table. I want to hear your story. I want to hear what you've gone through. I want to know what it's been like to be you for the last 18 months. And I want to do that. Not to convince you that you're wrong and you didn't experience that, but to understand, to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Look at verse 37. Know in all these things we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, verse 39, neither height nor depth nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When I am secure in God's love for me, I am free to love you. Would you write this down? Can you, can you, could you say this to a friend at the table? Number three, God loves me, so I won't separate from you. I'm securing God's love for me, and I'm not going to separate from you. 
Now that's the challenge I want to leave before you as we close the service. I want you to look at those statements. I want to ask you if you can say those statements. I want you to think about September 12th when we have this new format. We have a Ridge Bridge Hour. If you're able to stay, and I, I don't want to guilt you into a rule saying you've got to be at 10 o'clock. If you want to be there at 10 o'clock, then come. I'm not going to guilt or shame anybody of being there at 10 o'clock, but I invite you to come to experience that kind of fellowship as we get to know one another around tables. Would you stand as we close in prayer? Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this time that we could spend gathered together at the bigger table. Jesus, you are the head of this table, and we are brothers and sisters in Christ. I pray that your love would fill us from your spirit, that there would be true peace, not false peace, that happens in our relationship with one another. Jesus, I ask that you make me more like you because of the time I spend with my brother and sister who's gone through a different experience and that I would listen and I'd be shaped by what you're doing around us. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would fall on Maple Ridge Church, that you would pervade every part of what we're doing. So that when we leave here, every time we worship, every time we leave fellowship, Lord, we leave here more, a little bit more, loving you a little bit more, a little bit more conformed to your image. So we yield ourselves to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we all pray. And everyone said,